This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. The text says, He, meaning Jesus, was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive anyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let us now pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you that you have extended this mercy upon us that when we ask, when we seek, and when we knock, our prayers are answered. We trust, O God, that because you are good and because you are faithful, that we shall have everything that we need day to day, that you shall provide and forgive and protect us, and that in all of our days, when we go in your name, that we will go in the same peace and love that you treat us, your children. O oh God, we ask in this time that you would stir your spirit in this place, that we would feel your presence, and by that presence, understand, know, engage, and embody your comfort, your peace, your strength, your hope. We ask, O oh God, that our eyes, ears, hearts, and minds be opened, that our very hands and our feet be animated to deliver your daily bread to those who are in need. And, O oh God, we ask that you would transform our souls into good and fertile soil for the planting of your word so that it might grow within us and bear good fruit in time for the kingdom of God. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's good to be back, and all week long, I was getting messages from people in this church who said, who is that guy that you had to come out and preach to us last week? He was really, really good. And uh, so that's my friend Jason Kilby. If you weren't here, you can go online and you can find a video of his sermon. And uh, he told me, I asked him if he would come and preach, And he told me, he says, you know, our church is in the middle of transformation. We are literally swinging hammers every Sunday. We come together for a brief prayer and for worship, and then we get to work because we're trying to transform the old furniture store on Main Street into worship space and ministry space for this community. He said, so is it okay if I come kind of as I'm dressed? I've been been working. I'll probably be in a t-shirt. I said, perfect absolutely perfect because it'll help emphasize what I try to say each and every week, and I hope it's effective, that the work of the church is not just what happens in the sanctuary, but it is what we do out in the world as we try to transform the spaces we occupy into that that is holy unto God. So I said, it's perfect. Come exactly as you are. In fact, even though we're a pretty church up on the hill, we accept anyone who comes into this sanctuary exactly as they are. The interesting thing about Jason, uh, besides the fact that he's about 8 foot 10 or something like that, uh, is that he's become a really, really good friend of mine, 
even though we probably disagree on more things than we agree on when it comes to certain theological points or social issues and this or that. But both of us have the same commitment. We're both committed to the gospel. We're both committed to the idea that pastors need other people to hold them up, that we need to encourage and inspire one another, that we need to help keep each other strong, help keep each other accountable. And in doing that, he's become such a good friend and a benefit to my ministry. And to be honest, we don't even talk about the stuff that we disagree on. We just come and we share time together. We try to work out a few times a week together to tend to our bodies in addition to our minds. And I'm really, really grateful. I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to go on too long about this, but I can't impress enough upon anyone that doesn't know. And because there's very few people in here that are, have any experience with ministry, you just wouldn't know this. But when you're a minister and you go to a new town, it's really hard to find friends. I mean, I feel like I know everybody, but I can't be friends with everybody. I have a responsibility to pastor the people in my church. You all are not in a position to become buddies of mine or confidants. So people like that are very few and far between, and they're very, very precious. And that's just not the case for somebody like me who's new in town. It's true for pretty much any pastor. So he's been a blessing to, to me personally, and he's been a blessing to my ministry, and I'm so grateful that he accepted the invitation to come, and I'm so grateful to you that you made him feel welcome while he was here. And I hope to cultivate what him and I have with one another among all of you, so that even though there are people in this sanctuary who might not agree on every jot and tittle of things theological or social or political, that we can still recognize that what binds us together is so much more important than those wedges of the division that try to divide us. Amen? All right, well, let's get to the sermon then. So this text comes from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and it comes after a very significant, poignant part of the gospel, which is when we have the parable of the Good Samaritan, and then immediately after we have the story of Jesus at Mary and Martha's home. And both of those stories try to open up our eyes and open up our hearts of compassion to help us to see things that people normally don't see. So the first story of the Good Samaritan, he's trying to help a lawyer see that Everyone who has the capacity to extend upon to us mercy is our neighbor. And if we want to inherit the kingdom of God, then we must extend compassion beyond the lines that divide us in those superficial ways. Then immediately after, he tells the story of, of going into Martha and Mary's home, and, and one of them is busy doing all kinds of things, and the other one is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And he praises Mary for sitting at his feet to, to take up the wisdom that he is trying to impart upon this family. And then he comes to this story right here. It says that Jesus is praying somewhere and his disciples come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, John the Baptist taught his disciples, we're asking you, teach us how to pray. We, we want to know what is the right way to do this. We trust you. We follow you. And he says, when you pray, pray like this. My Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, which means you are holy, which means you are good, which means you are infinitely faithful. You are so much beyond, transcendent, all of the messiness and the contamination of this world. Holy, holy Father, we ask that you would give us our daily bread. We're asking that you would give us exactly what we need just for today. We're, we're not asking for so much bread to get us through the week or through the month or through the year. We want only today's bread because if we come to you each and every day for just the daily bread, then we are always in relationship and we are always dependent upon you. And then he says, ask God for forgiveness. God, forgive us our sins because we're fallible. We let our emotions get in the way. We do things that we know are beneath our calling. Forgive us for all the ways that we fall short because after all, God, we forgive others who are indebted to us. And finally, he says, when you pray, ask God for protection to protect us, to keep us, to, 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 to keep away the temptation of the enemy. Keep us, protect us from falling into the temptation to do evil, to descend into our base lower nature. 
He says, this is how you should pray. And then, then he goes on to say, you know, imagine this. Imagine that one of you goes to a neighbor and you say, hey, neighbor, uh, I know it's late, but I just had some unexpected guests show up at my home and I don't have anything to feed them. I need a little bread. Could you help me out? And imagine that that neighbor said, listen, man, I just got into bed. The door is locked. My kids are asleep. You know, don't bother me. Uh, I, I have nothing that I can give to you at this time. Jesus says, he will eventually cave in and give you what you need, not because he's good, but because you're persistent. Persistence alone will get you what you need. Now, if that's the case, imagine how much more and how much more willing your Father in heaven will be to give you what you ask for because God is infinitely good, not because your persistence, but because of the faithfulness and the love of God himself. And he says, so, you know, if you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you'll find what you're looking for. And if you knock, the door will be opened unto you. He says, after all, if one of your children came to you and asked for food and you gave him a snake or a scorpion, you wouldn't give him a snake or a scorpion, would you? And he says, you who are evil, geez, Jesus, that's a, it's <laughs> kind of harsh. <laughs> Jesus says, you who are evil at least know how to take care of your own children. So how much more will your heavenly father give to his children when they are in need? It's a good lesson. And, and when I read this, I'm reminded that we can engage this text in various ways. I love the Bible because it stands the test of time. There's wisdom that is embedded in the holy scriptures that I think we're foolish to ignore or believe that we have evolved past. I think it's worth diving into the text, and it reminds me that we can read this in a variety of different levels. We can read it like we would read any story. Okay, we have Jesus, we have these characters, and Jesus is teaching the characters how to pray. We, we could read it just on the page the way that the story is written like that, as a third party, an observer to the action. Or we can get a little bit deeper inside the text. We can say, okay, this is Jesus, and he's teaching his disciples. Well, we're, we're disciples, or at least we try to be disciples of Jesus. And so by extension, when Jesus is teaching them how to pray, he's also teaching us how to pray. He's giving us instruction about how it is that we should approach God and giving us reassurance that not only will God provide for what we need, but that God is good and God is abundant and God will not withhold any good necessary thing from us. But then we can go even a little bit deeper and we can recognize that not only are we disciples of Jesus, not only are we called to follow him, we are also evangelists. The word evangelist comes from the Greek euangelion, which means good news, meaning that our job, in addition to following Jesus and living like him and listening to him, is to go out and to proclaim the good news, to tell others about the good news of Jesus. Our job is to follow the commission that is given to us in the end of the Gospel of Matthew in the 28th chapter when Jesus tells his disciples to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And remembering that Jesus is always with us, we should teach everyone else the things that Jesus has commanded us. So we have a responsibility to go out into the world and for anyone else who is looking to the answers for their questions, who is looking for a response to their prayers, our responsibility is to say to them, listen, when you pray, pray like this. Ask your God who is holy in heaven to give you what you need, to forgive you your sins, to protect you from falling into temptation, knowing that God will not withhold anything from you. And we tell people who don't know this gospel, listen, God is good, God is better than us, and God will not withhold anything from us. So if we ask, we will receive. If we seek, we will find. If we knock, the door will be open to us. That is a message that we bring out into the world world. Amen? Okay, just making sure everyone's still with me. I heard a lot more amens when Jason was preaching on the video, so I'm starting to get a little sensitive here. So this is the message that we bring, and it's important for you to know this, that if you take that message, if you tell others the good news that God hears your prayers, 
And as far as I'm concerned, that's good news because there's a lot of people who stand in need of something. And when we say, unlike any other world, religion, or philosophy in the world, that our God hears us in a very specific way because who God is, and God responds to us in a specific way, not only tending to our spiritual needs, but also our material needs, I believe that's good news. So you must be prepared for the inevitable question that they will ask you when you tell them that. And here's the question. How? How exactly is God supposed to do this? Oh, sounds, sounds all fine and good, Mr. and Mrs. Christian. Like, I, I, I'm glad that you're bringing me this great news. I'm glad that you believe it, but I just, I just have to know because I'm not a part of your religious club. I just want to know, how exactly does God answer my prayers, give me what I ask for, provide what I'm seeking, open doors that I knock upon? How exactly does that happen? And here's the answer. It's us. Jesus established in the time that he was here on earth before he ascended into heaven something called the church. We are the assembled Christians who call ourselves disciples of the master Jesus. We are placed here for a purpose. We are saved not to sit, but rather saved to serve that we are called to go out into the world and to do the work in the world because we believe that what Jesus says was true and we believe that when we pray, Father, we want you to, uh, to give us what we need, our daily bread. Uh, we ask that as it is in heaven, it shall be on earth, that those are not only words of comfort and of hope, but they are also marching orders, that our job is to make earth resemble more like heaven. That we look at the world and we look at our congregations and we look at the world and we look at our congregations and we look to the scriptures and we imagine heaven and we realize that our job is to make this community that has no allegiance other than the kingdom of God, that this community, this assembled group of believers that we believe that we are brothers and sisters with one another, that this group of people who seek to follow Jesus seek to make this community more reflect the love, the glory, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness, the acceptance, and the love of the kingdom of God. And so we are the ones who answer the prayers. We are the ones who provide what people are seeking. We are the ones with our hands on the knob who open the door when people knock. Amen? Now I could end it there and everyone would clap and applaud because it's the shortest sermon they've ever heard Joey Pusateri preach. Woohoo! except for a couple things. And I'll be brief. First of all, I, I can't stop there because I'm passing it up an opportunity to celebrate. You know, you know, I've been here for about two years, which is just long, a little more than two years, just long enough to learn something about the history of this congregation. And I'm so glad to know that I step into the shoes of a long line of pastors and lay leaders who have made a reputation in this community to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I see organizations that persist and exist even today, the Family Services Center in Boyle County, and know that First Christian Church had a direct hand in the founding of that organization. I, I look at our relationship with all of the other churches and organizations in this community, such as the Salvation Army and what we do, the NAACP, the banquet of which we had last night here in this church again. I don't know how many years we've been doing it, but longer than I've been in First Christian Church. I see all the ways that we reach out and we try to get involved in the things that are going on. Last year, I said something crazy like, you know, there's a drug epidemic going on and that's an issue that's near and dear to my heart. So I think we should do something about that. And this church responded by getting involved in ASAP and Hope Network by uh, helping me host uh, a recovery, uh, an, addi an addiction and recovery six week series for Wednesday Night Alive two years ago. And then just this year, we had a recovery Sunday. Year before that, we invited Isaiah House to come in and to baptize 21 or 22, depending on who you ask, people who walk through that baptismal up there. That when we ask for this congregation to do those things to resemble the kingdom of God, this congregation responds. And I would be remiss if I didn't point that out for our celebration. Just a couple of weeks ago, somebody's home burned in our community, almost lost their lives and lost about every possession they had. That broke my heart. It broke the heart of many years. And so we all came together and we decided that it ain't going to be much, but we're going to do something that we're going to make a dent in that need because by God, that's what we're called to do. And so we put a list out of what the needs are. And within days, all of those needs were picked up. Within days, we had a room that is filling up with stuff. 
And within days, that room is going to be full and complete and we can go deliver the answer to the prayer that they put out there because that's our job. I can't stop that sermon there because I have to say this. And then I also have to say this, that that's not the way everyone sees the church. That the people don't see the church the way that we've been trying to be in the last couple hundred years. And, and don't get me wrong, I know we're not perfect. I know we've made mistakes. I know we still make mistakes. I know that we have a long way to go to fulfill the call that God has given us. I, I understand that. But I, I think we get more energy when we celebrate what we've done right. And then that parlays into doing the effort of what is left to be done. But I can tell you that I'm 41 years old and I've spent more than half of my life outside the church. And the reason I spent more of my life outside the church, because I looked at the church and all I could see was the hypocrisy. All I could see was the bigotry. All I could see was the people sitting up on their high horses in the seat of judgment, looking down upon people like me, down their noses. And I know that there are a lot of people that have had really bad experiences with the church. And they have come to the church in the middle of the night like that neighbor to the person's door and knocked and they heard the voice say, go away, the doors are locked, I'm already in bed. And that's their experience. And so it's not sufficient for us, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, it's not sufficient for us to sit in the pews and wait for the need to come to us. It's not okay, it's not enough for us to wait here on Sunday morning in our sanctuaries with the genuine hope and prayer that somebody's going to show up at that door in need and knock. It's not enough, it's not sufficient, it's not going to work for us just to wait for the need to come to us because of the damage that has been done in the eyes of other people out in our communities. We have to go out and start doing some knocking on doors ourselves we got to walk up to the door of poverty and say, knock, knock, and they say, try that again. We walk up to the door of poverty and we say, knock, knock, and they say, then we walk up to the door of homelessness and we say, knock, knock, and they say, we walk up to the doors of the hospitals and the treatment centers and the assisted living facilities, the jails and the prisons, places where people are suffering and where they believe that they have been forgotten. And we go up and we knock on the doors. We say, knock, knock. And they say, and we say, we are the ones who have come to bring you what you've been praying for. And they would say, you're the answer to our prayers. And we'd say, actually, no, you're the answer to our prayers because we pray each and every Sunday that God would make us a church. And that's why we came knocking. Amen. Welcome to the table of love and of acceptance. Because it's not any human beings with our fallible emotions or self-interest that sets this table, but rather the spirit of Christ himself, we can say confidently that all are invited. And if you hear the call of Christ beckoning you to this table of reconciliation of love, we hope that no one will stand in your way to step forward and to receive that grace. This is a table of healing, a table of mercy, a table of justice, a table of love. We ask all who are weary and heavy laden to place their burdens upon the yoke of the Lord and to step to this table and to receive that love. It was established on the night that Jesus on the Passover gathered with his disciples and after having taken a loaf of bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to all of them, saying, take this and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. And as you remain standing, we move into our invitation to discipleship. I don't think I mentioned it uh, last week. The reason I wasn't here is I was at the uh, General Assembly for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Des Moines, Iowa. And I went with a delegation from, from this congregation. I went with uh, your associate pastor, Griffin Ryan, and with uh, lay leader, Candy Williams. And I, unlike them... Uh, made the decision to drive because I looked at the flight information. I thought, well, you know, it's about six-ish hours between driving to the airport, flying, layovers, and all that kind of stuff. Plus, you can only pack so much. You got to rent a car. I'll just drive, be a few extra hours, and I'll have my car. 
I made the wrong decision. <laughs> and let me tell you why. It's not that being in the car for nine, 10 hours bothers me. I've done that plenty of times. It's that once you get to Indiana, from like Indiana to Des Moines, it's just flat fields of corn for seven hours. Mind numbing. But uh, we did have a wonderful time uh, while we were there. I got to experience a lot of what General Assembly has to offer. And I say that to say this, be looking forward to more information about it. Uh, we'll be coming together and figuring out the best way to issue a report because this affects everyone in this church. We are a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in all of its expressions at all levels. And so uh, you deserve to know what's going on. And I hope that you're eager to know what's going on in our church. Uh, this is the moment that we set aside uh, in our worship service for anyone who is looking for a church home. If you are uh, somebody who has uh, never come to Christian faith before and you'd like to make a confession of faith today or intention to be baptized, you can do that now. Or if you want to transfer membership from another congregation or if you just never joined a church before and you'd like to make First Christian Church your home, you can do that now. All you have to do is come down and stand with me and uh, uh, we can discuss that right here and I can give you a big old hug in front of everybody. And uh, you can do that while we stand and sing our hymn of discipleship. I stand here beside Jane Boyd, an elder of this church, slightly confused as to what it is that she wants to say here before us, but I'm so grateful that you have come forward. Uh, we love you so very much in this time that you've been recuperating from your illness and, and surgery and the time that Jerry has been going through his health concerns. We hope to continue to surround you and love you and all of our prayers. I'm not here to join the church. I belong to this church, and thank God I do. I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to be back in worship. And I also cannot tell you that not only am I a blessed child of God, and God had a plan for me, but your prayers, your thoughts, your cards, your food have made all the difference. I can, I can never begin to tell you how lifted up. Prayer is palatable. You know when you're being prayed for, and you have the strength and the faith to handle whatever comes. And we've had some things to come that we need to handle. But I am well. I'm starting rehab this week. And I'm just so thankful to you, my church family, and to God. And y'all, I'll be writing something official in the highlights, but I just couldn't not say how wonderful it is to be here today. And I love you all. So I'm glad this is Jerry. Joey was great. I'll be great too. That's it. <laughs> In the spirit of prayer, let us go now and pray over our sister Jane at this time. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for the gift that you have given this church in Jane and Jerry Boyd. We thank you for all of their years of service, but not only that, all of the love, the patience, the mercy, the grace that they pour into each and every moment of service to this church. We know, oh God, that they have prayed for us in our times of need, and it is a joy and a privilege for us to pray for them in their time of need. We ask, oh God, that you would open our eyes, ears, hearts, and our minds, that our hands and feet would be those that deliver the daily bread to this lovely family, and we ask that we do all of these things, not for our own glory or aggrandizement, but rather for the glory of the kingdom. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns in your kingdom. Amen. And go in peace.